Fine, we can start off with questions. Guruji, please could you tell us what, what it means to serve and what are the mechanics that lead to service? And is service different to different kinds of people, for example, serving a guru or, or serving one's employer or something like that? And should there be a balance between service and one's own personal life? What constitutes service? That is the basis of the question. Is this going on fine? Can you hear me at the back? Hmm? I'm trying to get the feel of it. Uh, yes, that's a bit better. Fine. What constitutes service? Service is performed by everything which is natural. Observe a flower, how well it serves us in its beauty and its fragrance. Observe the rain, how well it serves us in giving the water for things to grow. Observe the sun, how beautifully it serves us in giving heat and light. So, what constitutes service is to express our real nature. And our real nature is nothing else but also an offering. This very offering is the real basis of service. Why people fail to serve is because they are not natural to themselves. Because of karmic values or sanskaric values, wrong thinking, wrong action, they have lost the art of service. Service has no mechanics. If you apply mechanism to service, then it becomes not service, but a drudgery. Because you have mechanized it. But if service is allowed to flow, This thing is not serving me well. <laughs> ah, that's better. Now I can hear myself, you see. So as I said, if we apply mechanisms or mechanics or a pattern to service, it becomes a drudgery and service ceases to be service. For service is an art. And all offering is an art. Hmm? Now, this very offering can only be properly performed if it is used as an offering. Now, we know when we offer or pay homage to anything, it is done without any selfish motive. In other words, there is no sense of return. When we work for a boss, there is a sense of return. That is a necessity. That we work, we have to make a living, we have to pay rent, we have to buy food, we have to clothe ourselves. So, that is business. I give you so much and you give me so much in return. But even while working for the boss, a person can be of service only when he goes the extra mile. Work stops at five o'clock. Most people watch the clock. 
as a matter of fact, many people go to work not to work but to watch the clock. <laughs> and immediately it, struck, it strikes five, off they go. I mean, uh, we can also take into account the 15 minutes they spend in the cloakroom. And that is supposed to be service, stealing the boss's time. So, when the man works for a boss and he just does that little extra, then he is doing service. The other is doing business. Fine. I give you so much, you give me so much back. Fine. And many people do not even deserve the wage they earn. And that becomes thievery. Right. Now, like that, in every aspect of life, if things are done in the sense of an offering from deep within ourselves, with all sincerity and with all love, and doing a, a thing for the sake of doing it, that is service. Now, service is far different from servitude. When we talk of servitude, it is a form of bondage, where we are bound down by certain rules and regulations. But service, as I said, is an art, and art is freedom. So when we serve in the spirit of an offering, it is a freedom that is expressed from deep within ourselves. Service does not bind. It frees a person. That kind of freedom has its own rewards. It requires no payment. It has its own reward in the self-satisfaction that is gained, in the whole re-patterning, re-molding, re-styling of our lives. There is the great benefit. And this repatterning, remolding, restyling can only le lead to greater happiness. Then you find other kinds of service where a person joins some organization, for example. Um, the school feeding scheme. I don't know if you have it here. We're poor children are fed. Um, or the Cripple Care Association, or the Deaf and Dumb Society, Blind Society, whatever. I have known many people because I have been associated with various organizations. These people come there and do work. They really work hard, but the motivation is nothing else but ego expression and not self-expression. There again you find a difference. An ego expression is to pander to one's self, making oneself feel important. That I am in a position to command. That is very binding. What are you commanding? Hmm? Everything that you perform, being ego-activated, is never satisfaction-producing. It never produces that inner sense of joy. Hmm? So, one you because of the ego, you go and do some work in a charity bazaar, have a stall on the street corner and sell things for a certain charity. And you feel, ah, I have done something. Could you feel elated? Now, is that elation 
genuine or not. There's a wonderful test to it. Hmm? Now you come back and the organizers say, oh, you've done such a wonderful job, a pat on the back, and you feel so elated. Then you'll find someone that will come and find fault hmm? and will say, oh, you know, you could have done this in a different way or you could have done this much better. And instead of being elated, you become deflated. Why? Because the motivation was ego and boosting the ego. And that kind of service, it might have a certain value, but it does not have a genuine lasting value. Hmm? Now, if the very same surfer, uh, service was done as an offering, then praise or blame will not affect you at all. Because once you find the inner joy there of serving, hmm, it could be praise or blame, you are not affected. You become like the lotus flower, hmm, growing amidst all the mud and yet untouched, forever remaining pure, because your very offering is joy and joy is the essence of purity. Good. These are little incidences that we come across in daily life. So, true service is always an offering without motive. The one that really knows how to serve is truly a karma yogi. He works for the sake of work. He works for the sake of work and not wondering or anticipating the result thereof. That is the Karma Yogi. Now, as he goes on, as he proceeds on this path, he will find that he could perform the maximum amount of work with the minimum amount of effort. Now, there would be mental effort, there would be physical effort in the work involved, but because of the stillness that's created in him, the effort becomes effortless. That is the secret of work. That is why some people, very few in this world, can work 22 hours a day and never feel tired. Two hours of sleep is enough because the body requires it. They are subjected to a body. So that requires some rest. So, here, because of the service being an offering, an inner stability is created. And having the inner stability, the whole world around the person could be in turmoil, but you are untouched. As one proceeds on this path of serving for the sake of serving, now you will find many times that things do become difficult. Hmm? Sometimes the cross is hard to bear, but it has its own rewards. Hmm? It has its own rewards. So, when we serve, for the sake of serving, when it is motiveless, when it is egoless, then the service has value and it is evolutionary. It is never stagnating. It is like our flower. If the flower stops growing, it dies. The life of the flower consists in its flowering, for that flowering is life. And life is never stagnant. 
it forever flows and flows and flows all the time. And that comes because it is serving without motive. Now, if we examine the word motive, it could be interpreted, interpreted in different ways. Hmm? Is there an altruistic motive or is there self-motive? Self-motive is ego building. An altruistic motive is ego diminishing. Hmm? Now, our teachers want to teach people to help them in their paths so that their lives could become happy and joyous and they could go nearer and nearer on the path towards divinity. Hmm? If that is done for the sake, not of oneself, but for the sake of others, then Although there is a motive involved, the motive becomes motiveless. It is a motiveless motive because the self is not there. I am not a prep teacher or a full counselor because I want to be looked up to. I am a humble servant, more humble than the humblest. To me, the street sweeper hmm? or the lavatory cleaner is also an expression of divinity. And I serve not the street sweeper or the lavatory cleaner, but I am serving divinity. Be he saint or sinner, that is not my business. My business has to do with the Divine. That is why every day when we meet each other, we say Namaste. I bow, I salute the Divinity that is within you. Now if we remember that, that we are forever bowing to the Divinity in another, hmm? then service assumes its truest form, then service is the offering. How beautiful, how beautiful to be able to offer oneself. Hmm? Now this applies in every facet of life. Hmm? Husband and wife, hmm? if they could only learn to offer themselves to each other. What a wonderful life it could be! Hmm? You have been hard to me, the wife might think. That is your business, you have been hard. What must I be? Soft. Hmm? Yes, I must be soft. But if I fight back, then he is going to become more harder and vice versa. So, in that sense, you too are offering yourself to your beloved and for that moment he could be totally wrong. But you know within yourself, that he loves me, he does, and even if he's made a mistake today, he might be in a bad mood, tonight it will be fine, perhaps when we go to bed, <laughs> perhaps when we are together, it will blow over. Therefore I always advocate, if you have twin beds, throw them away by a double bed. Yes, yes. The closeness, that is what I'm talking about. Hmm? 
the closeness, that is what I'm talking about, and not other things that some people might be thinking about. Hmm? The idea is to develop greater and greater closeness. Good. And as greater and greater closeness develops, then life just becomes an offering. Because if he is her and she is him, hmm? that itself is the flowering of a married life. Hmm? The petals of the flower do not find them apart from the stem. It is all part and parcel of the one construction, the one picture that constitutes life. That is an offering. Hmm? So natural, so spontaneous. Hmm? How do we do that? How do we do that? That is done by just being ourselves, hmm? by being our natural selves, and not the artificial facade that we create around ourselves. If people can only learn to be themselves and stop projecting an image which they wish to be, so what people do, they live in an image which they are not. So living becomes a wishful living. Hmm? A wishful living. I had a little note from someone who mentioned that instead of the wishbone, I wish, uh, instead of the wishbone, I pray it could be my backbone. Very beautiful. Very beautiful. That backbone is courage. Hmm? That I am responsible for myself. I am responsible for my actions because I have that backbone that keeps me up and steady. I want to be myself. And that is what meditation and spiritual practice is all about. So that life could become an offering an offering to divinity. Hmm? What are we here for? We are glorifying the expression of divinity. And the expression of divinity is nothing else but glory. Hmm? And we misuse it. We misuse that privilege by the free will that has been given to us. Now I wonder, if it wasn't really a mistake to be awarded a free will, hmm? you will ask, why was man given a free will? Hmm? Because it is by that free will that all the problems in life start happening. Hmm? All the problems in life is because we have free will. And if we use the free will in a good manner, no problems. And if we use it in a wrong way, problems. Now the old boy upstairs must have had some plan in this. <laughs> there must have been some plan in this free will business. Yes. If there was no free will, there would have been no evolution. If there was no evolution, there would have been no expression. If there was no expression, there would have been no manifestation. And even divinity, the unmanifest, cannot exist without that which is manifested the relative and the absolute are part and parcel of each other. So, this free will came about hmm, on its own 
as fragrance emanates from a flower. Hmm? So, free will was not created. Free will is an emanation or a projection of divine will. Hmm? And through the process that this emanation or manifestation has gone through, it has gathered around it all this dust and dirt, whereby divine will is covered. For to work according to divine will is to live a natural life. And because of free will, we have made a natural life into an unnatural life. And that is why, that is the impediment, why we have not understood the meaning of service. Now, the offering service does not mean martyrdom. Martyrdom is a kind of imbalance. Hmm? It's an imbalance. It is martyrdom mostly originates from a certain fanaticism that you have a purpose. Hmm? You have a purpose conjured up by your mind and you become a martyr. Hmm? That is not service. That is not offering. This has been done. This has been done by great saints for an entirely different reason altogether. That by me sacrificing my life so many thousands of others can benefit. For them, that sacrificing of the life, that martyrdom, had an altruistic purpose and therefore that was an offering. But in daily life, some people try to become martyrs, hmm? self-suffering martyrs which is not necessary at all. Hmm? Which is not necessary at all. Many people become martyrs to try and express an inferiority complex in the form of a superiority complex. Hmm? There's a quarrel at home and the wife says, I'm going on a fast. I'm not going to eat until you, you know, fix things up. Yeah. Motivated martyrdom. That kind of martyrdom is blackmail. <laughs> yes. But rather, rather, an appeal from the heart in offering. I don't agree with you, but if you think it's right, go ahead. Hmm? Go ahead. And then the man will start thinking, you know, something here. Hmm? He will start thinking. So, you kill with kindness. Hmm? You convert with love, not martyrdom. Hmm? You see, you see what service means. It has so many, many facets. So many facets to that beautiful, sparkling diamond. Hmm? And yet, each facet contains the brilliance of all the other facets. It's like a holograph photo 
photograph from read holograph yeah holograph now he goes into meditation when I speak <laughs> yes. yes yes he does uh, now I've been told a bit about holography uh, where each bit of the plate contains the entire picture. So even if the entire negative is destroyed and you just have a little bit left, that little bit will contain within itself the entire picture. Hmm? So, likewise, in the service, in this offering, the entirety of all virtue, of all goodness, is contained. Hmm? That is offering, that is service. Now, coming to the service of a, of a guru, hmm? why do you want to serve a guru? Why? Because the Guru is going to lead me to salvation, therefore I must serve him. Hmm? He can't lead you to salvation. And if you find any Guru claiming that, forget him. Discard him. He's not necessary. Hmm? But if the Guru says, I can show you the path, hmm? but you are going to walk yourself. Hmm? I'm not going to carry on my back. I can't. Then you can listen. Hmm? And the proper service to the Guru is not the little expressions that you would do for anyone, any friend. Any visitor that comes to your home, you will see that his laundry is done and his tea is made with apologies to Savita and Usha. <laughs> and to see that, you know, all the comforts are there, things like that. You do that for any guest that comes to your home, especially a guest that you love very much as they love the Guru very much. Fine. Good. And that is very, very much appreciated. Not the service only, uh, no, not the, the actions, but the love that motivates that, that creates that. That is appreciated. The love is seen, shining. Hmm? Good. Now, that is part a very, very small part of the service to the Guru. The real service to the Guru is this. Show him that you are progressing. Show him that. You don't need to show literally. It can be seen. Hmm? Sometimes you meet someone, right, one of the chillers, and, oh, I have been doing this, and I have been doing that, and I and my brother or my sister or my husband has been doing that, and is that serving your guru or just satisfying your own ego? Huh? Rather, you know, Guruji, this has been done, or that has been done. The guru knows who has done it and who has not done it. He knows. It's not necessary to say, oh, I did that and I did that. Yeah, it's not necessary. That is service. That is offering. That is not wanting recognition. That is the true offering. For even without wanting to be recognized, the true Guru recognizes already. The very action speaks so much louder than words. You see how simple it is. 
the very actions performed by the true chela speaks louder than words and the guru does not need reminding that I did this for that one and I did this for that one and I did that for that one. It is not necessary. It is just known. Hmm? Good. So, there is a selflessness involved. Hmm? And when that selflessness is involved, and as the ego is diminished, hmm, or the ego used in a totally different perspective, then that is the greatest service to the Guru. Hmm? My Guru, when I asked him, I said, Swamiji, now on this last trip, what have, tell me one thing, what is the most important thing that you have done in your life? You had the opportunities of starting up your own ashram. You had the abilities of having thousands of students throughout the world. Why did you not do that? Why? What stopped you? And do you know what he told me? I came, I was born in this world for one purpose, and I have achieved that purpose. Hmm? I have achieved that purpose, and when I leave my body, I am the happiest man for having achieved the purpose. So I ask him, what purpose? Then he tells me, you find out. <laughs> you see, you see, you see. Yeah, yeah. That is a guru. That is a man. Hmm? A God man upon earth. Yes. Because it is not given to everyone to teach, perhaps. But it is given to everyone, the meanest creature, to do their dharma selflessly, and that is service. That is service. So, the best way for a chela to serve his guru is to be worthy of the teachings of the guru. That's the best way. Nothing else, nothing else, nothing else. Hmm? Nothing else. And to be worthy of the teachings of a guru is not to keep on theorizing, although that helps to understand things, but the practical aspect of life. When the guru asks his chelas, teach, this is the way for this age. Teach people how to find themselves, their true selves, for each and every one is a sparkling diamond covered with dust. Help to blow off this dust hmm? in a very humble, simple, selfless, devoted way, with love, blow off this dust. It's not necessary for it to be there. And let the diamond shine in its true splendor, for each one is a diamond, each one is divine. Hmm? That is the service of the Guru. Hmm? That is the service of the Guru. Some chelas are very kind. They know that a Guru must also eat and sleep and drink water. And, hmm? and some of them are very, very helpful for that, which is appreciated. Hmm? A, a, a live Guru is better than a dead Guru. Yes, yes, yes. A guru never accepts anything for nothing. Never, ever. 
His nature is to give, always. He gives and he gives and he gives to his utmost ability, always. But to be able to give, his body too needs to be sustained. Hmm? That happens, that happens, it comes automatically. He just works. Hmm? So, selflessness, devotion, not necessarily devotion to the Guru, but devotion to one's Dharma, and automatically devotion to the Guru develops. Hmm? And devotion is never worship. Do remember that. Devotion is an expression of love, selfless love. Devotion is the desire to become one with another. Hmm? And through the Guru and Chela relationship that I have experienced, and I only talk of experience, is this, that if I love my wife, there is some motive involved. Even in its minutest degree, there's a motive. Hmm? If I love my job, there is still some little motive, something to do with self. But when there is a closeness, a relationship between Guru and Chela, there is no motive. There's no motive. It is a self-desire to find self-realization. Hmm? And the one that has trodden the path that knows the way, he would be the best to approach. And one approaches such a person as I approached my guru in total humility. Hmm? I told him when we first met that I am nothing but a blank sheet. You write on it. Hmm? That is the offering. That is the offering. In other words, to approach a master which you feel some connection, where some spark has been sparked off, hmm? such a man is approached as I did to Pavitranandji with a blank page. In other words, it means an open mind, totally open mind. And I used to argue with him. Oh, yes, I used to. Hmm? If there's any point I disagreed with, I said, I'm sorry, I don't agree with this. Hmm? Explain me more. Yes, uh, by argument I mean debate. Debate. Oh, yes. Until I understood what he was trying to say. And sometimes it took me many years to understand what he had said. Hmm? As I gained a greater maturity and more knowledge, I understood more. And this is the experience of everyone. When you read, say, the Bible or the Gita, if you have read it ten years ago and you read it today, you have a total different understanding of it because you have developed more and the greater your development, the vaster your awareness the greater your perception, the greater the understanding. Hmm? So, service is an offering, a motiveless offering. Hmm? And that is why in history, in all scriptures, they went out to do the Master's work. Huh? But to do that, there has to be faith, hmm? this devotion. Hmm? You have doubting Thomases, fine, but their doubts too disappear. Hmm? And then they, those doubting Thomases become Saint Thomases. Huh? Yeah? Yes? Yes, yes. It's good to doubt. 
it is good to doubt. Hmm? Because the doubt springs from your mind. It has nothing to do with the teacher. Remember that. And if you overcome your doubt, you are overcoming the discrepancies of your mind. Hmm? So it's good. Because a doubt is the springboard of further inquiry. Hmm? It's the springboard for further inquiry. And as you go on inquiring and inquiring and inquiring, you find hmm? you have to knock for the door to be opened. Yes. You have to seek to find we know that. We know that. There's a whole tradition behind all these various faiths in the world. And we have been brought up in those traditions. And we understand those traditions. But we don't practice them. And that is our misfortune. Hmm? So, that is service. Service is a spontaneous offering, hmm? a spontaneous offering to divinity. Right? And everything else is taken care of by itself. Okay. Good. Next question. Or oh, have I gone on too long? Uh, nine, twenty-five, and six seconds. <laughs> How do you know I need water? Thank you. Good. Tonight we want to do a prayer for Swamiji. Hmm? Actually, that's your grandfather, you know. <laughs> Good. I'll do a Vedic chant and thereafter um, we do f some minutes of meditation. Hmm? Okay? Guru Brahma, Guru Vishnu, Guru Deva Maheshwaram. Guru Rev Parabrahma Tashme Shri Guru Ve Namaha Mukan Karoti Vachalan Pangu Lagayate Girimaha Yet Kripa Tamahavande Parmanand Parasmeshwaram Shantakaran Bujagashayanan Padmanabham Sureshamaham Vishwadharan Gagan Sandesham Megavalan Subhagamaham Lakshmi Kant Kamalanayanam Yogi Birdan Gamayam Vande Vishnu Bhavabayan Hari Sarva Loke Kanad Thanamaham Namaha Purastadhyastam Pushtatasye Namo Astute Sarvantayeva Sarvanaha Ananta Viryamita Vikram Basatvahan Sarva Samaptishi Tatoasi Sarvan Sarvatayeva Sarvava Ananta Yodi Shitatoasi Kshamayata Mavapua Yantrasya Mamadoshane Kshamyata Mamadu Sudana 
अहन यंत्र भवान यंत्री मम दोषो न दियतामेक माता च पिता चमेव तमेव बंधुश्र सखाव विद्या द्रवीण सर्व मम देव देव दुर्लभ मनुष्य मीरन ये नंबमयू संभावनीय धर्मास्ते तस्म पित्र नमो नम सहनावंत सह नौ भून कर्तु सह वीर करवा वह तेजस्वी नवदीत मस्तु मा वी द्विषा शांति 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 पीस अंटु पीस लाइट अंटु लाइट ब्लिस अंटु ब्लिस फुलनेस इंटु फुलनेस